Hello and welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Tui Vu. Coming up on tonight's program, California crafts new rules for the sale and use of medical and recreational cannabis, plus a look at an ambitious initiative to slash San Francisco's chronically homeless population in half. But first, the New York Times recently reveals that President Trump's son, Donald Trump Jr., met last June during the presidential campaign with a Russian lawyer who purportedly had damaging information about Hillary Clinton from the Russian government. Trump Jr. maintains he did nothing wrong and released the email exchange to set up the meeting. The revelations add a new twist to the investigation into whether President Trump's inner circle colluded with the Kremlin to influence the outcome of the presidential race. Meanwhile, on Capitol Hill, Senate Republicans are planning to vote next week on a revised plan to repeal and replace Obamacare. They released their new plan this week, but it still faces an uphill battle for passage. And joining me now are KQED's politics and government reporter Marisa Lagos, San Francisco Chronicle senior political writer Joe Garofoli, and political senior writer Carla Marinucci. Thank you all for being here. Carla, let's begin with you. There's yet another revelation today, right, in this drip, drip, drip of revelations that a former Soviet counterintelligence officer was at that meeting uh, with Donald Jr., the Russian lawyer, uh, Jared Kushner, former campaign yes. chair Paul <laughs> Manafort, the list goes on and on. Is that, is that enough, though, to prove collusion? Uh, you know, I, at this point, someone should remember that famous Watergate phrase, it's not the crime, it's the cover-up. Yeah. Uh, collusion is, is not a legal term, but it certainly is becoming a cultural term in this case when you have this series of events in which the Trumps have just not been <laughs> clear with everyone. It was about uh, adoption. Uh, they, mm -hmm. they, just two days ago, uh, Donald Trump Jr. was on the Hannity show saying, that's it. There's nothing else there. Now we're finding more. The bottom line is it, this is handing ammunition, not only to Robert Mueller, but to the Democrats out there like Brad Sherman here of yeah. California, who's uh, launched the first impeachment mm -hmm. uh, issue with unobstruction of justice. Uh, how much ammunition is it, though? Because there's been suggestions that this is a smoking gun, right? But, but there's still a lot we don't know. We don't know if this <laughs> led to other meetings. We don't know if this actually led to real collaboration. Right, I saw the, the analogy, of, there's a smoking gun, but no dead body, right? right? So, yeah, yeah. like, we don't really know. I think the issue is, to Carla's point, credibility at this point. And does this lose his base? Does it make Republicans peel off? Not quite yet, but the case keeps being built. And I mean, to the point yeah. of lies and lies on, on top of lies, just within the day that the New York Times broke the story of the emails in which Don Jr. put out his own, you know, yeah. version of them on Twitter, or not version, the same version, he, you see within that one New York Times story how much he lied to them in like within a three day <clears throat> period. First it was about adoption, then nobody else was there. Now we hear this. So I do think, that especially for the special prosecutor, Robert, Robert Mueller, it, it, it just adds fuel to the fire for their investigation. And he gets a guy, potentially the, the Russian guy, is actually a, a U.S. citizen. He, has, he can subpoena him so he can yeah. talk to him and possibly get him to flip on the Trumps. Because right now it's the, the people in the room are Trump family members and the former uh, and, and the former campaign manager. He seems to be in more so, trouble so, legally potentially he, than yeah. anyone else. He might want to flip. Yeah. Yeah. So right now you don't collusion. Mm -hmm. You don't have uh, legally, mm -hmm. but you have issues perjury, mm -hmm. uh, campaign don campaign donations. <clears throat> right, obstruction of justice. Or, All I mean, of this is is becoming a perfect storm. And as Marisa said, <clears throat> at, now the issue is at what point do Republicans say enough already uh, and cut themselves loose? And, what's going and, on. and within the broader context, right, we have this this list now, now of people within Trump's inner circle, and it keeps on growing, of people who are admitting to contacts with Russian officials. We have uh, the you web know, Jared Kushner, of course, and we have, um, but then we also have Attorney Jeff Run, Attorney General Jeff Sessions. We have former <laughs> National Security Advisor Michael Flynn. So, what has been the reaction from Republican officials here in California? Well, <laughs> <laughs> sprinting, <reaction>? sprinting, <laughs> sprinting from questions and cameras. The people who are concerned here are the seven Republicans, congressional uh, members, who are in districts that are going to be targeted by the Democrats. These guys are, are freaking out because they want nothing to do with Trump. They, this is this is a stink that hurts that 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 bleeds onto them. With the exception and, of Dana Rohrbacher, oh, yeah, no, he, who has who has he pretty much person. embraced yeah. Russia and embraced the Trump line that hey. Uh, nothing to see here. This was just opposition research we were, uh, that, that they were looking at. And to the point of Trump's base, I think in California that's even more important, right? Because you have you have these seven. The reason these seven districts are being uh, 
targeted by Democrats is they all went blue in the presidential race. They voted for Hillary, but they still elected uh, Republicans to, the, to Congress. In California, where Republicans are at such a deficit when it comes to registration numbers, and there are so many more independents, even in these fairly safely you know, red districts, I do think that there's more of a danger of sort of a base peeling off than maybe broadly nationally when you look at the sort of 37 percent that Trump yeah. has managed to keep in his camp. Well, and also making national headlines this week, of course, the uh, Senate uh, GOP revised health care bill. Now, Carla, how would this, how is this different from the original version? Well, I mean, at this point, uh, some of the tax issues, remember, uh, giving a tax break to the wealthiest, that's been peeled off. But the fact is the health industry still gets tax breaks, medical device manufacturers get tax breaks, drug guys get, get uh, tax breaks. And the fact is, it is still on the backs of the poor and older Americans. And this is where Republicans are going to have a tremendous problem when you're talking about the kind of cuts that they're talking about. Uh, to Medicaid. Yeah, I mean, I think the Medicaid issue is really key, and especially here in California, where we have really embraced Obamacare and expanded it to so many people. One in three Californians is on our version of Medicaid. And so the deep cuts they're making, while they've put in some provisions, and while California law could, could sort of still protect people in terms of what plans could offer or not offer, cost is going to be the issue. And not just for the very poor on Medi-Cal, but for all these people who have had to rely on the subsidies through the exchanges. I mean, if, if, <coughs> if premium rates sky rocket and the spigot of federal money on health care is cut off, we're going to be looking at very, you know, people who are in the middle class who are deeply hurt by this. So what are the chances of this actually passing then, Joe? Because, well, we, you know, I mean, bit. last month, Mitch yeah. McConnell already abruptly canceled the yeah. vote on the original uh, bill. Um, and already Senators uh, Rand Paul and Susan Collins are saying, we're not voting for this thing. There's no more room so for error one, here. One, you can lose one more. And that's about it. And uh, so he, and there's going to be a vote he hopes next week if he has the votes. But they have to do something. As, he, as McConnell says, as the Republicans say, we have to, we promised this for seven years. So they have to deliver something. The something they're delivering, though, looks less and less like something different. I mean, because they, when you're, uh, they, they gave back the taxes on the rich. And, you know, that's a lot of those people are Republican voters. They hated the, the tax mm -hmm. on the rich. So that's, so he's already kind of gone back on some of the promises mm -hmm. they made. Uh, it is a very, thin line and right I think, now. I, you know, a big thing you heard in like rural areas who, where they really did benefit from Obamacare, but was this uh, sort of anger at this idea of the mandate, that they ha were told by the government they had to buy insurance. And it's interesting to see how Republicans are trying to get at that. Like, in practice, they're going to repeal a mandate, but they're also allowing insurers to punish people in a lot of these bills who, who go roll off insurance rolls. Again, the money issue is there. So it's it almost seems like they're trying to do something that on its face looks like it's, it's repealing Obamacare and offering something different, but it's actually going to hurt people more. And so you have to wonder, how does that play politically? The key is the timing. When is it going to hurt right. them? And yeah, so mm -hmm. this, if this doesn't go into play for a year, then they're safe for the midterm elections. But if it goes in place before that, which is looking less and less likely, then be, they could be safe. The other concern <clears throat> is this Cruz Amendment, which allows for uh, sort of sketchy budget priced uh, plans. Skimpy plans yeah, is what they're uh, being called. Uh, <laughs> that they'll offer <laughs> that's preventive name. care. <laughs> yeah, that's right. right. And which would create two different baskets of, of uh, patients, the healthy, <clears throat> younger ones and the older, sicker ones. And we know who's going to pay more under that plan, apparently. Right. So, so um, but are Californians still protected from that a little bit, given that we have our own mandates on, on what insurers can offer and what they can't? I would say it's not entirely clear because healthcare is very complicated, as we've all learned in recent yeah. years. But I think the issue is we may be on paper sort of protected in the terms of the plans that are, are allowed to be offered in this state, but what those plans cost is an open question. So mm -hmm. even people on employer-sponsored plans arguably could be impacted by this. And then also there's this issue of under this new plan, how much um, sort of deference and is given to the Department uh, of um, Health Care at the, at the yeah. federal level to sort of give waivers to states and do other things. And a lot of that, you know, is going to potentially benefit red states mm -hmm. at the expense of blue states. And so I think that that's something that's going to raise questions, too. And, and so, Jill, there's a tough dilemma here, right, for Republican, uh, for Republican lawmakers. One, you either defend taking insurance away from millions of Americans if you pass this thing, or you fail to pass it and you have failed to uh, repeal Obamacare as you had promised the American people for the last seven years. Mm -hmm. So how how is this dilemma affecting the Republican Party's ability to present itself as the governing party? Well, that's it. They, there's no excuse for them not to do something. They have all the, the levers of power in Washington. 
and, and you're going to see the screws really tighten on someone like Dean Heller in Nevada, a senator mm -hmm. there, where the state has a lot of people on, on, on their version of, on Medicaid and uh, a lot of people getting the benefits of this program, but he's up for re-election and he's facing a stiff challenge. What, which way is he going to vote? Is he going to vote with his party or with the people of his state? Well, Mike, it was interesting that Rand Paul was the second <clears throat> Republican who came out and said, I don't even want to vote on this, because before all we heard about was Susan Collins of Maine, who's also said this, but also Lisa Murkowski from Alaska. Cool. I mean, the list of people on both the sort of moderate and conservative flanks of the party keeps growing, I feel like, that have been public about <clears throat> their concerns. And so it really does make you wonder if they're going to have the vote. interesting when the party needed its head most, uh, Donald Trump, to bring people in and talk to them about it, He's in France this week yeah. celebrating Bastille Day out of out of pocket in Washington, and that's got to hurt the Republicans as well. Well, that, but you know, we also have we have, so we've got a bunch of things happening <laughs> right now. We've got the health care fight. We've got the whole Russia Donald Jr. situation, and it's consuming coverage coming out of Washington. So, how is this affecting the rest of Trump's agenda? What agenda? No, what agenda? <laughs> Nothing. He's, he's had, there's been no significant piece of legislation passed. Uh, most of the action has been in the regulatory uh, era, sp uh, uh, particularly on the environmental front, various laws being tweaked, stuff that we're, we would, we'll see happen over time. But what's he had? He's well, had, had nothing to present to the American people. And a lot of that keeps yeah. getting held up in court. So <clears throat> most of it is most controversial executive orders that fulfill a lot of issues yeah. around immigration and those mm -hmm. sorts of campaign promises blocked by the courts. Even some of these environmental rollbacks are being blocked by the courts and other attempts at rolling back Obama era regulations like uh, protecting people who go to for-profit <coughs> colleges. There's a lawsuit over that now. So I do think that it's not just politically but actually sort of practically their ability to institute any sort of but agenda. The one thing that Republicans really wanted was tax reform and we still have a tax reform plan that's what 127 words is uh, on two pages. Yeah. Uh, it, it hasn't been spelled out that's going to be the big fail for Republicans. Which could have been right. the easiest thing for them to pass, too. But they, they decided to go they, with health care first. They got sidetracked by a yeah. lot of other things. I want to also talk about uh, what's happening within the, de the California Democratic Party, right? And I think a clear indication of what's happening could, we could look at it through the lens of the cap and trade bill, uh, which lawmakers are expected to vote on on Monday. Um, there's already a bunch of environmental groups lining up to oppose it. What's going on there? Yeah, I mean, this is interesting. We've seen this sort of climate change debate really change focus in recent years as Brown has continued to push an agenda. And a, a year or two ago, it was all the oil industry trying to kill the bill. Now, Brown has made a lot of um, sort of olive branches to them, included a lot of things in this that are aimed at protecting biz businesses. And now you have sort of the environmental justice community, people on the left flank of the party really pushing back. Um, he has tried to bring in a sort of companion bill that deals with air quality issues to, to address some of those concerns. But I do think, as you noted, Twee, this, this speaks to kind of broader issues within the Democratic Party. Party. And as the party has grown in California and its base has grown and their power has grown, business interests have put a lot more money into electing moderate Democrats and they have a lot more power in Sacramento. And so what you see is the sort of more liberal progressive Democrats, <laughs> not just on cap and trade, but on other issues like around single payer, which I know we want sure. to talk about, really sort of pushing back and saying this is not what Democrats stand for and you are not really a Democrat if you're well, supporting this. Well, and Nancy Pelosi is now trying to lay down the agenda for what Democrats stand for, right? And I know that, Joe, you spoke with Nancy Pelosi <laughs> um, earlier this week and, and she's working on a plan on how how to present Democrats in the Trump era. What is her plan? Well, that's we're waiting to see what that plan is. And she got a, a bit kind of ticked off at, at me. I read her column about her a couple of weeks ago saying Democrats don't have a plan and, and how she is responsible for some of the, the problems Democrats have, not all of them. And she said, uh, well, we're coming out with one. Uh, and she likened it to this era to when George Bush was president, we started his second term. High level popularity, had both houses of Congress, but <clears throat> the Democrats went and they, and she asked like Steve Jobs and other people like, how do we rebrand ourselves? How do we rebrand ourselves? I guess, well, you have to know who you are. Yeah. So Democrats then sort of researched and, and, and came up with some ideas. That's what the process they're in now. They're going to start rolling out some stuff soon. Who but, are they talking to? Did she give you a sense of who they're talking to? They're, to is it rural voters? They're or? talking to rural voters, people who are not, who have kind of left the party. They're, they need to bring black voters in. Black voters did not vote for Hillary Clinton in the same numbers they voted for President Obama. Uh, they need to, and they need to sort of keep the Latino coalition going, but they they don't they don't know who they are yet. They said, "Oh, here's our platform." And it's a sprawling platform, but 
that's you need a bumper sticker. And they, they don't and have a bumper sticker. This is the issue in those seven House races <clears throat> uh, you both have been talking about. Is Nancy Pelosi? That is that is one thing. I mean, she's the Republicans <clears throat> are going to try and hang her around the neck of any Democrat who runs against them, uh, her leadership, and and where the party goes in the future. And as you said, here in California, we're, we're talking about gas tax. When we when, when the Democrats own the supermajorities in both houses of the legislature and every statewide office. Uh, then they've got to deal with a party that's basically splitting apart over, you know, who's who's the business friendly Democrat and who is the progressive Democrat on issues like gas tax, health care, uh, single payer, uh, you know, and and uh, infrastructure, other issues that are out there. And Marisa, so then real quickly, what are some of the other issues dividing California Democrats? Well, I would say single payer is the biggest issue, right? Yeah. We had a bill that got through the Senate was sort of uh, a shell of a bill, to be honest. They didn't have a funding mechanism for a four hundred billion dollar plan. And essentially, um, after the assembly uh, speaker killed that, he has gotten death threats. There's been a lot of consternation on the left that sort of Democrats are abandoning their base. And I think this is an issue it's going to keep going, especially if health care gets through the Senate. Yeah. Okay, so much to discuss, and clearly not enough time for the three of you. <laughs> <laughs> Carla Marinucci with Politico, Marisa Lagos with KQED, and also Joe Garofoli with The Chronicle. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Medical cannabis has been legal to use in California for more than 20 years. Last November, voters approved legalizing it for recreational use, too. State officials now have less than six months to finalize the rules for medical and recreational pot and begin issuing licenses for everything from growing to distributing it. I spoke last month with Lori Ajax, who leads the state's efforts to regulate marijuana. Lori Ajax, thank you so much for joining us. Yes, thank you for having me. Prior to your current job, you worked at the agency responsible for regulating alcohol. How is this, regulating cannabis, different from regulating alcohol? A big difference is, is that alcohol is federally legal, which cannabis is not. So some of the things that we take for granted that the federal government does when it comes to alcohol regulation, such as testing standards and labeling, uh, the state is doing that um, itself for cannabis regulation. You brought up the fact that cannabis is still illegal at the federal level. Do you worry about a possible crackdown? Attorney General Jeff Sessions has already said he's opposed to any attempts to legalize cannabis, even for medical use. Uh, do you worry about a crackdown if, at the federal level, and how would that affect California? So we worry about a lot of this stuff, but, but we're, we feel pretty confident that as long as we're making sure we're keeping it out of the hands of minors, that we have public safety, consumer safety as the forefront of our regulations and making sure that we're, we're keeping, uh, making sure that things aren't going outside of the state, I think we're pretty confident that as long as we're keeping in line with that, that, the, that we won't have any federal intervention. But of course, it's something that is out of the control of the Bureau, so we focus on the things that we can control, which is putting together a model regulatory system for California. Have you been looking at other states that have legalized recreational cannabis, looked at how they handled it, and applying some of the lessons learned there to California? Yeah, we've been talking to a lot of the states that currently have either adult use or medical regulation legalized in their state and trying to uh, look at what they did in their states and make sure we don't make the same mistakes in California. Colorado and Washington and Oregon, they were the first pioneers to do this. But I think we can learn from, you know, strong regulations around uh, manufactured goods such as edibles and whatnot. And also what Oregon has been going through with the testing labs and making sure we have enough testing labs in place to make sure that there's the cannabis will be tested and we know the product's going to be safe. So we're looking at all of those things. And I think we just have to be ready that once we get our regulations in place, they're finalized, we start issuing licenses. If things aren't working, then we got to look at, is there a better way to do things and a more efficient way to do things? So we want to keep bringing people in the regulated market and keep them here. Because the industry is largely cash-based, what kinds of challenges does that propose for you in trying to regulate it? Yeah, it's, it's a difficult situation when uh, the folks that you're regulating deal mainly in cash. So it's, um, it's one of those things that it also is difficult for the, the licensees and making sure they're keeping their employees safe and trying to transport cash. So that is a big concern for, for the state on figuring out the banking issue. Uh, one thing uh, that is right now is State Treasurer uh, John Chung is, has a cannabis banking working group that we've been working together with him, with other uh, 
uh, the taxing agencies and the industry and the local representative to try to figure out a solution so that we can make our licensees, our employees safe, um, and, and try to figure this banking issue out. Most of the cannabis uh, that's grown in California still ends up in the black market. Can you describe your agency's efforts to stop the growth of that black market, and, and how are you going about doing so? Some of what we're looking at is having our track and trace system that the Department of Food and Agriculture will be uh, developing that program. So all cannabis is going to have to be tracked from cultivation all the way to retail sale. Um, also, uh, for the Bureau, once we issue those licenses, we We've got to be out there doing our inspections, checking on licensees, and making sure people are following the rules. You're trying to regulate an entirely new industry here, and an, an industry that has been underground, and much of it, uh, you know, very black market for so long. It is a big task and a huge challenge, and, and I have a lot of great people that work for the Bureau, but we're also working with a lot of different agencies, Department of Public Health, Department of Food and Ag, um, you name it. But I'll tell you what, there are times when you start to think about the enormity and, and, and then you have these regulations hearing when people come out, they're really positive. Even though they might not like everything we put in regulations, it energizes the Bureau to keep going and I'm really confident we're going to get this done and get it done right for California because it's just so important for, for the people of California that we get this right. All right. Lori Ajax, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Turning now to homelessness, a local nonprofit, Tipping Point, has pledged to raise $100 million through private funds to help San Francisco cut its chronically homeless population in half in five years. San Francisco already spends more than $200 million annually on support services for the homeless. Tipping Point CEO Daniel Lurie told me last month why he thinks this new public-private partnership will succeed in getting people off the streets. Joining me now is Tipping Point CEO Daniel Lurie. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Well, cutting San Francisco's chronically homeless population, that's roughly around 2,000 people right now, that's a big goal over the next five years. How do you plan to do that? It is, and Tipping Point has come up with a three-pronged approach. One is to create more units of housing, whether that's building new stock or mining existing buildings for units that are still available. Uh, the second prong is to uh, attack the root causes, which means going after the criminal justice system, uh, the foster care system, and the mental health system, and helping to beef them up, because if they aren't working properly, no matter how many units you build, you are going to have people hitting the streets uh, as fast as we can house them. Mm -hmm. And our third prong is to work very closely with the city and county of San Francisco and help optimize the public sector. And so helping them uh, do their work even more efficiently and effectively because as we all know, that's actually where the real dollars are. Uh, the city and county of San Francisco is expected to spend $300 million next year on this issue. And we wanna support them in doing that at, to the best of their abilities. Let's uh, take your first point, housing, and dig down deeper on that because uh, that of course is one of the biggest issues. and and. San Francisco's real estate landscape is already so jam-packed. Where would you find new sites? It feels like the whole city is under construction right now. There's no question. But there are sites. There are private sites. There are city-owned sites. Uh, there are empty churches all over this city. Um, it takes $500,000 and over five years to build a unit of supportive housing. We can all agree that that is... Uh, too expensive and takes too long. We need to get those numbers in half if possible. And so Tipping Point's gonna work with the city, with private developers, with union and, and labor to see if we can do a better job on that front. There is no question that we can build more housing in this city. We just need the will. Why did you decide to take this on now? It's the issue of our time. If we don't take it on, who will? I mean, there is no one coming to the rescue. Every administration for the last 35 years has tried to take this on with varying degrees of success, um, but what we're seeing on the streets today is simply unacceptable. We're not taking care of our own, and Tipping Point wants to do that. And are you looking to other cities? Are there models in other cities that you would like to adopt here? Listen, we've, we have looked at different cities, whether they be Houston or Salt Lake, um, but we are seeing that this is a national trend. 
homelessness is on the rise. The federal government for years has not been spending enough dollars to build affordable housing. We have a crisis at the state level here in California, not enough supportive and affordable housing being built. So yes, we've looked at other cities, but there is no city that uh, matches the rental market and the expensive rental market that we have here in San Francisco. So like um, many but, other problems, we have to come up with an innovative solution here in San Francisco. But why reinvent the wheel, for example? You know, Houston and Salt Lake City have this program where they track people in homeless programs yep. and make sure they're getting the most suitable services yep. for them. Uh, New York has a program that identifies people most likely to end up in jails and emergency yep. rooms that they, they, so they can target the services toward them. No, and, and we definitely have, and we've, we've gone up to Seattle, we've seen what they're doing with wet houses and in Portland. So we do know what works in other cities and we, we absolutely will take those ideas but I will say that there is no place that Houston you have a lot of land that you can build on Salt Lake was starting from a pretty low base in terms of homelessness Seattle they just came out with their point in time count somewhere near 12,000 homeless people more than here in San Francisco mm -hmm. so uh, we need to come up with innovative solutions tipping point is working hand in hand with the private sector and the public sector to do just that and when there's good ideas nationally like always we will bring those to bear on this issue why are you focused only on san francisco is there um any interest here in working with for example oakland and san jose absolutely. to make sure you're not pushing the homeless burden to them absolutely so we at tipping point have always been focused on the bay area for this initiative in its first few years we want to focus solely on san francisco we have been in talks with mayor schaff we know Mayor Licardo well. Santa Clara just passed a bond measure. Um, we think if we can make this work in San Francisco, it absolutely can work throughout the region. So there are long-term plans. If this is successful, to go ahead and expand it to San Jose, Abs Oakland, absolutely, other communities. Absolutely, and, and we know we have mayors in place in those, in those cities that are eager for us to come there, but we first have to get it right, and we wanted to start here in San Francisco. All right. Much luck to you, Daniel Lurie of Thank Tipping you. Point. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. And that will do it for us. Thank you for joining us. I'm Tui Vu. For more of our coverage, as always, go to kqed.org newsroom.